Welcome to the Standing for Freedom podcast at Liberty University, where we defend life, liberty, and truth for the next generation. We're answering today the question, what's a biblical worldview anyway? And I'm joined by my friend, David Clausen, who is the director of the Center for Biblical Worldview at the Family Research Council. David, welcome. Thanks so much for having me, Ryan. Great to be with you. Well, I'm so glad you're here to talk about this really important topic that I think a lot of people in the church probably assume I'm a Christian, I have a Bible, and I have a worldview, so don't I therefore have a biblical worldview? Okay. No, that's what the vast majority of evangelicals who go to church believe. And so at FRC, we just launched the Center for Biblical Worldview, and part of our launch was a poll. Uh, George Barna, the well-known researcher and pollster, joined our team, and he put out a poll in the field and surveyed those who go to church. So he, he's done this kind of work for a long time. We know that 6% of Americans have a biblical worldview, only 6%. But what about those who go to church? You know, these are people who aren't going to brunch on Sunday. They're actually bothering to show up and go to Sunday school and go to church. And he polled that demographic, and 81% believe they have a biblical worldview. But when you ask them questions about what do they believe about the Bible, what do they believe about the person and work of Christ, what's their view on marriage, what's their view on the person of, of the unborn, we find that only 21% of evangelical Christians actually have a biblical worldview, which means they're seeing all of life through the lens of Scripture, only 21%. So what a difference between the perception and the reality that we're finding in most evangelical churches. Yes. So when you, as a center, are putting out content uh, to kind of reshape either the conversation or the thinking behind it, what are some of those things that you're doing? Yeah, the, f the first thing we put out is our biblical worldview series. Uh, which is where I'm just looking at all the different issues that we're talking about. So the life issue, religious liberty, uh, human sexuality, political engagement, uh, and how should we as Christians think about these issues. So let's just take the life issue, for example. I think you go into the, the, your average church in America and you ask you know, people, well, what does the Bible say about life? I think most faithful Christians could say, well, Psalm 130, um, 139 says, you know, we're fearfully and wonderfully made. And then you say, well, what else? I think you get a lot of blank stares. But the Bible teaches the person of the unborn from cover to cover. Um, and not just that, I think a lot of people think that, you know, those of us who are Christians, that they say, you know, you guys have only cared about this issue since 1973. Well, that's not true at all. Uh, church history, you can go back 2,000 years to the first century. Uh, Tertullian and Irenaeus, um, then Augustine in the fourth century, clearly saying that the Bible affirms the person of the unborn. So, so, Ryan, what we're trying to do with our resources, what does the Bible teach about these things? And then what has the church taught about these things for 2,000 years? And when you look at it, uh, Catholic, Orthodox, and Protestant churches for 2,000 years have affirmed the personhood of the unborn. And they've also been Orthodox on sexuality. Yeah. And it, it, the only the churches that have abandoned, you know, the, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, where theological liberalism crept in, the churches that threw out the Bible, they threw out the deity of Christ, they threw out the resurrection, those are the churches that are now woke and affirming uh, the whole LGBT spectrum. But churches that have stood on the scripture for 2,000 years have affirmed life, religious freedom, sexuality. You know, it's funny, the, kind of the obvious questions. Okay, first of all, history repeats itself. Um, you talk about the woke, uh, you know, the social justice movement today, social gospel movement about 100 years ago, soup and soap instead of salvation. Yep. Um, I think it was Cicero that said, uh, a child that fails to understand history remains a child forever. Um, and so when we're actually... Uh, the, the first step towards maturity, towards manhood or womanhood, is to actually learn that the whole world didn't begin the moment you came into it. So one of the things that you, you go back in history and you say, well, wait a second, where did hospitals come from? Where did orphanages come from, right? Uh, oh, the church did that because everything has some kind of religious name, St. Mary's, right, Baptist this, Presbyterian that. All of those things are steeped in some kind of a religious tradition. It's only been in uh, very recent history. Insurance companies and large corporations have taken over almost all of that, right? Why am I mentioning any of this? Well, the church has always had reasoning and argumentation, um, ethics that have forced the issue so that, you know, today, if you were to ask most Christians, it's about evangelization only. Uh, we don't even talk about discipleship. We don't even talk about 
um, a, a, a holistic ethic in terms of how to approach um, the public arena uh, that we're called, I mean, I don't agree with everything that Abraham Kuyper said, but not one precious square inch in the whole uh, domain of human existence uh, that Christ, who is Lord over all, does not say mine, it is His. So, obviously, uh, a biblical worldview has to have this in mind, that, uh, that everything that's out there, a Christian has been called to engage in, uh, to advance the kingdom, right? Um, so, how are, they, you know, obviously at Family Research Council, uh, we're very like-minded, we have a kinship, we're, we're excited to be partnering with you, uh, in August, uh, Courageous, Courageous Men's Conference at Liberty University. Uh, but how, you know, um, talk a little bit more, I guess, about this present generation uh, and their kind of understanding of what it is to even be biblical, uh, you know, in this present Well, you culture. mentioned a hol holistic ethic, and I think the loss of understanding that the Bible gives us a holistic ethic, that was why, largely why we're in the mess we're in. Uh, you know, I, I talked to pastors even in the, before the last election. There were so many pastors who said, well, you know, David, I know that the Bible talks about some of these issues, but I don't want to become too political. Uh, I don't want to be perceived as being partisan. And, you know, it's true. The Bible doesn't talk about every single issue that we engage in in, in the public square. But there are a lot of principles the Bible gives us. And there are some issues where there's a clear, thus saith the Lord, uh, that there are chapter and verse that we can go to. Uh, again, I've, I've mentioned it a second ago, but the, the life issue, that's not first and foremost a political issue. That's a theological and moral issue. Again, the, the Bible affirms the personhood of the unborn from cover to cover. Time out, time out. Okay, rewind that and then hit play again. Say that last thing that you said is primarily a what? I'd say it's primarily a theological and moral issue rather than just a political or partisan issue. That's just what you said, and I think it's really important that people hear that or think about that because almost, in, in, and I want you to keep going, but almost everything is treated like now that has become a political issue, I won't talk about it. So now that marriage has become a political issue, I won't talk about marriage. Um, now that the pro-life issue is a political issue, I really won't talk about pro-life. Um, you know, sexuality, so on and so forth. And so pastors are slowly retreating and you're seeing the neutering of the public gospel, the public witness, the prophetic voice, what, what have you, uh, because under the auspices of, we don't want to become too political. No, you're, you're right, Ryan. And what's interesting, that historically is an aberration. You know, for 2,000 years, you've had pastors in local communities, local uh, congregations, speaking to all of these issues. And why did they speak to these issues? Because the Bible speaks to these issues. Again, I'm not asking you know, the faithful pastors in this country to speak to issues the Bible doesn't speak to, but where the Bible is clear, we need to be clear. You, know, you and I went to seminary together, we've served in a local church together, and you know, I'm not, again, asking for pastors to speak where the Bible doesn't speak, but the Bible is really clear on some of these first-tier moral issues. And for us to retreat, I don't think that's a faithful witness. And you know, the, the prescription to this is, is pretty simple, actually. Let's just go back to expository preaching. Well, let's just go back to preaching through books of the Bible. And where these issues come up, let's speak to them clearly. Let's speak to them uh, boldly. Let, let's be winsome, Ephesians 4, let's speak the truth in love. But let's speak the truth to these issues. And I'm just, it, it just grieves me when I know that there are pastors who, for fear of kind of what the world thinks, kind of shrink back on these issues. And that's not, what, when I look at church history, uh, the, the, those who, the, the men who have stood in pulpits around the country and around the world who've been just bold and courageous, that's not the position they took. Yeah. Um, as far as the threats to the church today, okay, so go back in history, church history. Uh, you mentioned Tertullian, uh, some of the church uh, fathers, early church fathers um, that, you know, they were challenged on the orthodoxy of the Trinity, the, the person and divinity of Christ, all of these things, the uh, ecumenical councils, right, were moments where the church had to come together and respond to a particular challenge, whether it be Arianism, Nestorianism, Docetism, Marcionism, all of those things, <laughs> every ism, okay? Uh, and so they were all there in the early part of the church. Um, Today, 
our isms are different, um, but not so much different. Uh, in some ways, I almost feel like these are even easier uh, because they're not actually dealing with the doctrine of the Trinity. I think that's actually more difficult um, in some way, but that has been settled and every Christian should understand this. Um, today, our isms are like racism. Uh, today, the world calls it sexism or misogyny. We have a biblical view of complementarity uh, that needs to be reaffirmed every single generation, right? Um, uh, another one, another ism, pragmatism. Hmm. So let's find different ways that um, people don't see it as forfeit, but like, hey, is that really all that important? Uh, and I, you know, there's some kind of a theological minimalism that takes place so that we can, I don't know, somehow come together. It's like, actually, the differences are actually not minor. They're, they're, they can be really, really important. So what are some of the threats that you're seeing, some of the challenges? Sure, and you didn't even mention the, the moral uh, revolution that we're seeing with the whole spectrum of LGBT rights. That's it? I was just talking yesterday with some of our friends at ADF and uh, First Liberty and the Pacific uh, Justice Institute on the threats legislation like the Equality Act uh, poses to every single person of faith in this country. Uh, you know, th th that piece of legislation just, and I'm sure those who listen to your podcast are very familiar with the Equality Act, but just in short, federal legislation that would codify these contested categories of sexual orientation and gender identity uh, into federal non-discrimination. It would be the same as race and, and religion. And it explicitly goes out of its way to gut the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. That's right. And Ryan, I, I still can't believe it when I hear it, but you'll hear people around this country, even those in ministry, say, well, that's actually not that big of a deal. Well, this, if, if this were to become law and we're hanging by a thread, you know, our prayers are on Joe Manchin to make sure that he doesn't you know, go back on his word and get rid of the filibuster. Yeah. But if the Equality Act were to come law, all of a sudden churches don't have protection against uh, hiring people who disagree with their statement of faith. Uh, girls and women all of a sudden are not going to be able to have safety in showers and locker rooms around the country. And stuff that is so basic, but the, the, the threat that the moral revolution uh, poses to the church and to Christian organizations is massive. And if we don't wake up to these threats, we're going to wake up and be in huge trouble in a very short order. Yes. So uh, going, just mentioning LGBT, uh, Q plus um, HR 5, uh, the Equality Act. And by the way, it, it came up last year. I don't think, even though I do believe that it's not going to pass this go around, um, there's, there's been discussion kind of behind the scenes whether where Kristen Cinema is, where Joe Manchin is, whether he's for or against, what Kristen Cinema is going to do. Um, it, it's, it, I, most people believe that it will not pass. However, by executive order, uh, through the Department of Education, through DOD and other things, the executive branch wields a lot of power to do things that can hurt businesses, private institutions, universities, College of the Ozarks, for example, that's in their lawsuit. Um, there's, there's a lot of ways that it can wreak havoc, uh, havoc on religious institutions. Why is it so important going back to a biblical worldview? Because I think this is all, it's all one of those things where we talk about the ethereal, but let's talk about the concrete. Yep. Um, you're winning hearts and minds. You're literally trying to convince a bunch of Christians who are sitting in the pew to empty out those pews. They do need to go vote. They do need to participate. They need to know how to vote. Yep not just to go vote, but they need to know how to vote. They need to know what these policies are. They do have consequences. I don't want to be political, as some say, and you said this earlier. Guess what? Um, for I know the plans I have for you. That's not just a message from the Lord. Satan also has a message for that. And, and he, he, he does look at the public square as a way it could be a persecutor of the church, uh, it can be a way to enact a, a pernicious evil for the next 50 or 100 years. Policies do matter, uh, whether it be Soviet Russia, the United States, China's CCP, everywhere around the world. So how do we win the hearts and minds of this next generation? I think what we need to do, Ryan, is doing what kind of having the conversation that you and I are having right now is just being honest about the threats facing people of faith. I think too often we go along to get along and we, we aren't crystal clear about what, what's facing us. I, 
Uh, I know you've talked a lot about critical race theory. Yeah. And you know, there, there's been, there's big sections and denominations that kind of don't want to touch that for fear of being called racist or, or bigoted. Well, we, we need to call things out for what they are and be honest about what they're doing. R right now um, in Loudoun County, Virginia, uh, I'm from Washington, D.C., it's just right across the, the Potomac River. Uh, parents now, and these are people who voted for Hillary Clinton, people who voted for Joe Biden, are realizing, hey, it's probably not a good thing that my little boy or my little girl is being taught that they're racist. And now they're going to the school board and kind of causing a ruckus about it. And so, so I think, but to go to your, to your question, what we need to do is explain these things winsomely. I already quoted, you know, Ephesians 4, speak the truth in love. As Christians, we have to do both of those things. We, we can't just be loving and kind, although we need to be that. Uh, we're commanded by Christ to be kind and loving, but we have to be people who are known for con uh, as conviction. Uh, Bill, Billy Graham once said that when a, one man, when, when a brave man takes a stand, the spines of everyone else around him are stiffened. And I, I think as, as those who follow Jesus, yeah. we need to be willing to take a stand and, and just explain what the Bible teaches about marriage, about religious liberty, about sexuality, and, and present a vision for why this is good, uh, not just for us. We're not, when we plead for religious liberty, we're not asking for special privileges. We're asking for a, a public square, for a context in which all people are able to flourish and thrive. And, and as Christians, we believe that's the best context for the gospel to go forth. You know, we're not afraid of any ideology, any other worldview, because at the end of the day, we believe as we stand on God's word, we're going to win the day. Yeah. And so I think we just need to be clear about what we believe and why we believe it. Okay, final, final question here. Um, some go-to passages. So um, just points of exposition or you'd say, hey, this, this is a place that I like to, to go to or even teach uh, Christians or even pastors how to think biblically uh, about the public square. Yeah, it uh, might surprise you, but 2 Timothy 3.16 that says, All Scripture is breathed out by God and is profitable for teaching, rebuking, correcting, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. I, I think a, as Christians, we shouldn't be afraid uh, to use the whole counsel of God's Word. I, that's why I mentioned earlier, I think that pastors and Christian parents, one of the best things you can do if you're a pastor is to just preach expositionally through books of the Bible. Parents, I think one of the best thing you can do is to teach through books of the Bible with your children. I believe parents are the chief disciple makers in their home. And so I think what we need to do is just realize that every passage of the Word of God, and I've thought about this recently, Ryan, and even when I preach sometimes, you know, God didn't have to give us His Word the, the way He did, but He did. Mm -hmm. What a gracious, kind gift, this revelation we've gotten from our Creator. And so let's stand on that, let's be confident in that, and just go share that good news with everyone we meet, and I think as we do that, hopefully people will get a vision for how Christians can see the world and how that's best for all people. Yeah, very, very good. David Clausen, soon to be doctor, <laughs> uh, director of the Center for Biblical Worldview at the Family Research Council. Thank you for all that you're doing and for joining the Standing for Freedom podcast. Thank you so much, Ryan. Appreciate all the work you're doing as well.